In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Lead me to repentance, cleanse me from my sin, and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God, by His Son's indwelling presence, lead you to live according to His will. Amen. In the peace of His forgiveness, let us now praise the Lord.
his letter to the Ephesian congregation, beginning with the fifth chapter, the 15th verse, as follows. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The Word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Hallelujah. spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. He sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good or bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of our Lord.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, peace, mercy be yours. From God our Father, and our ever-living Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has ascended to the right hand of his Father, that he may rule all things for the good of his church, for you and for me. Amen. Before us we have one of those parables, we have one of those stories where you look for that which in the story seems to be a little audacious. Something that just seems to just strike you as being a little bit different. Or something that is begging for another explanation. There are a couple of things, of course, in this particular text that talk to that very point. A major one, though, is the audacity of undermining or underestimating unbelief. That's the basic theme for this morning. We see it at least twice. One sounds fairly reasonable, I think, to us, but the other one may not be quite as obvious to us, but, and we'll get to, the, to that one in a moment. Imagine yourself, you've received an invitation from your king. It's hard for us to imagine, because we live in a republic. We have people that are elected to serve us. We don't live in a kingdom where the king has, or for that matter, the queen, has all authority. But perhaps maybe you've seen examples of what it is to live in a kingdom, in a monarchy. Perhaps you've seen pictures of when the subjects of England have approached the queen. Do you know one of the things that they, were, that they must do? They must either curtsy, email, or they, they bow. You know why? It's not just civility that goes on here. It's not just, well, maybe tradition, but it's a little bit of that last. The reason that a man will always bow to his king or to his queen is because I serve at the pleasure of my king and of my queen, and if you don't care for me, Here's my head. You can chop it off. That's why you bow. It's to show obeisance. It's to show fealty. It is to show loyalty. It is to show that what you say I will do because you are my king, you are my queen, and I am here to do your bidding. Again, we live in a republic. We live in a land where we don't have kings and queens. Our story takes place, of course, where there were such kings and queens, more often than not kings. So when the king invites you, you show fealty, you show loyalty by doing what? What the king desires of you. So to not accept the invitation is very audacious unbelievable that they should say no to their king. The king who has provided them comfort, the king who has provided them safety, the king who has his armies there so that they will be able to live in peace. And yet here there is a wedding, evidently I would say a, probably a wedding for one of his family members, royalty, and yet there are people here who have the audacity to say, no, nah, not coming. Lord, the king hears this story, right? And he thinks, well, maybe they just maybe misinterpreted what I've asked. Hard to say. But he sends out another group of individuals to, again, once again, graciously do what? Invite them to this feast, to this, to this wedding, to this joyous event in the king's life that he wants to share with them. He wants them to be a part of it to enjoy all that he has to offer them at this particular moment, to feast with them probably like they have never feasted before in their lives, unless they were of court. Second time, we hear what happens. They treat his servants spitefully, and some of them are even murdered or killed. Now the king becomes enraged. I've invited you, I've been gracious to you. I've not only invited you once, I've invited you twice, and now you've even killed my servants 
whom I have sent to bring you to a joyous event. And so he kills them. He has them killed. Now this parable is told to the Pharisees and the publicans, or the Pharisees and the scribes of Jesus' day. The reason, of course, that this is being spoken to them is because the Christ, the Messiah, the one who had been promised, the one who, of whom they have been studying in the scriptures all these, all these years of their lives is standing before them. And they, they don't believe. Here's a true problem with that unbelief. They underestimate what the consequences of unbelief will do to them. They underestimate the graciousness also of the Lord God, their King. And in their audacity to trick or betray or to try to lead their Savior into making statements that would be hard for him to prove, they show that they don't care if he is the king. They don't care if he is the Messiah. They're going to do what they want to do regardless of whether they know better or not. Therein is the bigger issue. The audacity of unbelief, right? That we dare, or people dare, to not believe God's promises and God's gracious invitation. The Lord takes this wedding feast very seriously. And he invites his subjects to it, that they might feast with him and enjoy all of his blessings at this wedding feast. And they refuse. You might say, well, that's all fine, well, and good, but what does that have to do with us? I don't remember being invited to any wedding feast. Really? Think about this from the scriptures. God often portrays our relationship with his son as a wedding. The bridegroom in the setting is always Christ. And you and I, the bride, the church. And even though you and I have been unfaithful, right, we have sinned in thoughts and words and in actions. I mean, we, didn't we just confess that? Lord, I am not worthy, right? I have sinned against you in thoughts and words and in action. So we have been un the unfaithful bride to the bridegroom. Nonetheless, the bridegroom's love for each and every one of us is so gracious that he doesn't just overlook our sins. That's not what he really does. But his love for you is so deep, so wide, so generous, so all and consuming of him that he allows himself to do what? Pay the penalty for our infidelity, for our sins. This is the reason why Jesus goes to the cross for my sin your sins, for all of our sins, not just the people here, but everyone around the globe. Out of love, that kind of love, Jesus gives himself as the, the husband, the, the bridegroom who wants to be wedded to you and to me. In other words, he's made a commitment, right? For those of us who are married, perhaps, maybe, perhaps, maybe, when we said our vows to our spouse, we said, I will what? Cherish you in sickness and in health, love you, so on and so forth, until death do us part. 
That's a commitment, right? That's the commitment we make to our spouse, to our loved one, the one with whom we want to spend the rest of our days. That same kind of commitment, that same kind of promise God made to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. To cherish you, to honor you, to bless you, to grow with you. When you are sick, to be there to help you and strengthen you, to be your nurse and your guide and the rock of your salvation. To be all of that and everything more that one could ever expect or want from someone who says that I love you and that I will be there for you and that I will be there to serve you and make you well and happy. And happy. So let's begin this wedding with a feast, right? Let's invite all of our friends. And God does the same. God invites not only you and me, but all of our family as well, all of our friends. He invites everyone to the feast. In a couple of weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to go to that feast once again. It's called the Holy Supper of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's where He gives to you His pledge, His commitment to you that all of your sins are forgiven. For that's what He says in those words. Take and eat, take and drink for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This royal feast that God invites you to is that which sustains you in life and in death unto eternity. So that you can feast with God today, tomorrow, and forever and be absolutely certain that God has made a commitment to you, to each of you. That is unending and never fails. The last part, as I said, the audacity of un underestimating unbelief comes in the last bit. Perhaps this is a thing we don't understand because we don't understand that kind of custom in those days. So when you were getting married, right? Brides, you went with your bridesmaids, your best friends, and you went and you found dresses, right? Grooms, well, yeah, there's a tuxedo shop down the road if you wear if you wore a tuxedo, right? And we'll just go and get them. When I've been invited to a wedding, I <clears throat> tried to lose a little weight, and then also so I could fit in my clothes, those suits that I hanging in the closet, back corner. Uh, but I try to look my best, right? I try to find something that I want to wear. In ancient times, in the times of which this story is told, the bride's father, or the groom's father, or whatever, whomever I should say, provided you, provided you with clothing. We hear the man who gets into the wedding, right? And we're all saying, well, why is he upset that he's not wearing wedding clothes? Why is the king so upset? Because he gave him a new set of clothes to wear specifically for this wedding. And yet the man has the audacity, right, not to wear them. It shows his lack of love, respect, and then ultimately unbelief in the king's mercy and in the king's generosity. You and I all have received wedding clothes already. You know that? You know when you received them? When you were baptized. When you were baptized, God put on each and every one of you his robe, here it is, right? Wedding clothes. A robe of his innocence and righteousness. You are adorned already in your lives for the feast which is yet to come when God clothed you in his son's innocence and his robe of righteousness. 
You have been invited to the wedding, and you already have those wedding clothes in your baptism. And so God invites you to live in your baptism, to live in the grace of God, to understand and be excited about what God has done for you in the forgiving of all of your sons in Christ Jesus, your bridegroom, who has committed himself to you. Now you understand the audacity, right, of unbelief. To say no to that. And therein lies that part which we call underestimating it. It's hard to fathom God's love extent of it, the depth of it, the breadth of it, right? But here God once again reminds you and me of just how committed he is to each and every one of us that he has already adorned us in these wedding clothes, in our baptisms, that we might enjoy all of his blessings today, tomorrow, and into the future for all eternity. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Attend the feast. Enjoy all that Christ has delivered to you in his Son. Rejoice, really, right? Rejoice. Come and hear God's word being led by the Spirit. Come to his supper and receive this, this foretaste of what it is to be at the wedding of, of his Son for all eternity. Come. Come, he says. And enjoy. Receive my grace and my blessings day in and day out. Hear my word. Receive my supper. Join yourself and put on your baptismal grace, that robe of innocence, and live. Live with me. And live with all who have been invited to such a glorious event. The wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in true faith, life everlasting. Amen. We join together in making confession of this Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. And we further pray. Lord God, our Maker and Preserver. We praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them our rich measure of patience and wisdom and love. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold high office, uh, hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations. That we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth, where there are wars and peace, where there is hatred, let it be. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your mighty power to help and restore. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger.
sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed. And comfort all who are poor and infirm. Here is, Lord, as we also bring to you then our private petitions, including those four, Jane Bugby, Carol Gilbert, Ken Kelly, Don and Marietta Kuntz, Russell Holstrom, Eleanor Rhodes, Ray and Tina Spencer, Herm Weissman, Joel Murray, Brandon Yonke, Matt Becky, Mike and Warren Pearson, and their family. And also now, as we bring to you our private petitions, O Lord. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. You have called us in faith to be your own, that we may be led by you to serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. God by our Lord and trusting his promise, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. May you be led by the Holy Spirit to live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord in gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace.